This video is going to take on a, a little bit of a, an economics-y type topic, very topical at the moment. Um, how do banks create credit? Now, um, this is one of those topics that can take up an entire degree course. There are professors and Nobel Prize winners out there grappling with it, so uh, don't expect too much rocket science from this video. This is a beginner's guide to uh, how credit creation works uh, and I'll be throwing in a couple of other bits of jargon that are popularly associated with it. Uh, what is the money multiplier? Don't worry, I'm going to tell you that in a moment. And how does fractional reserve banking work? Okay, so all of that in a one video, but essentially it boils down to this. Um, what is credit creation? And more importantly, when people talk about the money you supply, what do they mean? Is it possible to have more than one definition of the money supply? And the answer is, yes it is. And I'll try and explain why that is in just a moment. Um, now then, a hypothetical scenario. Allow me a bit of artistic license here, okay? Um, imagine this is an island, okay, surrounded by shark-infested water. Shark, right? Another shark. All right, so it's an island, and you are washed ashore on this island. Now, bear with me, there is a point to this. All right, with a hundred pounds. Now, I admit, it's a fairly unlikely scenario so far, but bear with me. So, as far as you know, there's just you on the island, and you've washed ashore, and you go, oh, a hundred pounds. All right, somehow that survived the fact you've just been in the sea. All right, and you're thinking, right, well, I, I, I need, I've got a hundred pounds, I don't know anything about this island, it could be full of wild animals or cannibals or anything, so I want to wander around and see if I can find myself something to spend a hundred pounds on, um, and blow you down if the first thing you don't find on the island isn't it always the way um, is a bank. Okay, so you think, right, well, about £100, pound, just washed up on an unfriendly island, um, so maybe what I better do is, is put this money somewhere safe for the time being. All right, so you find a bank and you think, right, I know what I'll do, I'll go in and I'll put the money on deposit at the bank, all right, because until I can find something to spend it on, it's probably safer in there. All right, so you put your £100 pounds into the bank. All right, so that, there it goes. Now, then you sort of wander off, try not to get eaten, all right? Now, the bank makes a quick calculation, okay? It thinks, right, um, if Tim comes back in in half an hour's time, how much of that £100 do I need to keep back? Now, you might say £100, but actually that's unlikely. When you go to the cash point machine, you don't generally drain the entire account, okay? Um, you take £50 out or £10 or something, right? So the bank's going to be thinking, I need to hold some of this £100 back, but I don't necessarily need to sit on my whole £100 just in case Tim happens to want some out of the cash point machine tomorrow morning or comes back in and asks to withdraw it. So maybe what I'll do is I'll hold back um, £10, okay, and I'll lend out the remaining 90 Now the bank has a customer who wants to borrow money. So the bank keeps £10 back and lends out 90 to that customer. All right? And uh, the reason that customer wants the money is they want to trade, all right? They want to buy something with it. So if you're following me now, the 90, the 90 pounds in the form of an IOU, if you like, the um, customer wants to buy some goods, all right? And so basically they do a trade and this person who they've just traded with then decides to put the 90 pounds for safekeeping back into the bank. And the bank thinks, okay, I better hold 10% of that back in case this customer comes back looking for money tomorrow morning. So the bank keeps nine pounds and then lends out 81. Now, I'm running out of island here, but you probably get the idea. With a 10% deposit rate, if you like, or retention rate, the bank can keep creating IOUs that allow other customers to undertake transactions or to trade, okay? So the bank is guesstimating that it can get away with only holding back 10% of each deposit. It doesn't need to hold the whole lot. And actually, if you carried on this process with more and more customers, I'll stop after sort of the first three, if you like, you could work out 
in theory, how, how many IOUs or how much credit the bank could create off one deposit of £100. All right? And the answer, actually, on a 10% retention ratio is in total deposit terms, the bank could create effectively £1,000 out of 100. All right? If I change this to the bank keeping £20 back of the original £100, all right, then the bank would only be able to create £500 in total, all right, made up of deposits and credit. So, in other words, the rate that the bank decides to use to determine what proportion of, say, the £100 deposit it's going to keep and what proportion it's going to lend out determines, in turn, how much credit in total could be created from the original £100 deposit. All right, there's a little formula that economists use, which I won't bore you with too much, but 1 over R, where R is um, the rate. So, for example, if R is 10%, all right, then £100 divided by 10%, which is 0 0.1, is 1,000. Okay, if the, the rate is 20%, £100 over 0.2, that's 20%, is 500 pounds and so on so i'm being a little bit fast and loose with my economic jargon here but that's that's by the by the principle is that um, this system allows the bank to uh, generate if you like um, credit generate funds from a relatively small deposit base all right and that's the essential basis of what's called fractional reserve banking now you might be thinking there's a problem with this, and there is a big one. It relies on confidence. It relies on the bank judging, or perhaps being told by a central bank that 10% is the right ratio, for example, because it does rely on people not literally running back to the bank and demanding all their money back at once. That would cause a bit of a problem. And the whole of the banking system is built on that basis. I'm not expected to go running down to Lloyd's TSB this morning and empty all my accounts in one go. I mean, in theory, I'm entitled to do exactly that, but banking works on the premise that I won't, because my day-to-day -day existence doesn't require me to have access in cash terms to all the money that, in theory, belongs to me. All right? So, obviously, getting that ratio right is fairly important. And um, what we'll do is just wrap up by considering, in essence, um, how central banks influence the supply of money in an economy, because economists would look at this island and say, well, how much money is on the island? It depends what you mean by money, you see. Some people would say, well, there's only ever a hundred pounds here somewhere, isn't there? You know, that's what I washed ashore with. Um, well, maybe not. Maybe as soon as the bank enters a transaction with whoever this is, is the money supply, could you widen the definition and say the money supply is more like those two added together? if you know the money supply is sort of potential spending power let's say so you get these different definitions of the money supply they're called m's m0 all the way through to m4 and without going into the detailed economics of it they're based on the idea that money is a slightly fluid concept um, is it just notes and coins in circulation or is there a bit more to spending power than that okay now maybe a final note in this video on um, central banks and their role in this sort of whole arena because um, there is there are a couple of questions thrown up here and I won't attempt to answer them in detail but one of them is you know what determines whether that's a hundred pounds or not in the real world rather than this desert island where I was washed up and um, you know the money supply is something that has a direct bearing on inflation the more money in an economy and the fewer goods and services there are available to buy, the further the price of those goods and services will be pushed up. Okay, so, you know, if I put a central bank in here somewhere, governing all activity in financial terms on the island, um, two things, arguably, it could seek to influence. One would be that, and the other would be whether that's 10% or 20%. So what are the mechanisms available to a central bank to influence the money supply? Because the more money you have in an economy, as I say, the more it's going to fight for the limited supply of goods and services on this island, and that's going to tend to push up the price. 
So that has an inflationary impact. Okay, very quick summary. Um, and we're seeing some of this in action, sort of, um, at the moment. So basically three tools that can be used to influence what's going on in my scenario here if you're a central bank. Number one is um, something called the discount rate. Right. Um, basically, in short, there are IOUs out there that don't carry an interest rate. Okay, And the way that a central bank can influence that is if I asked you um, what you would effectively, what you would deposit now to get a thousand pounds in a year's time, if interest rates in the meantime are five percent, and the answer is right now, you'd only need to deposit around nine hundred and fifty-two pounds. Okay, and there are um, financial instruments out there, IOUs, bonds, that don't carry an interest rate. You buy them for one price and cash them in at another. They're literally called discount instruments. Um, and basically the price is influenced by that, money market interest rates. So central banks can influence the size of that discount rate. They tend not to in practice, it's a bit of a clumsy tool, but they can do. The second thing they can do on my little island is to change that reserve rate. If you make banks hold back more money, in other words, if you up the reserve rate from 10 to 20 percent, you instantly shrink potentially okay, your uh, monetary base. Now, that's a pretty blunt tool. It's not done normally very often that way. But you can see that under fractional reserve banking, the fraction matters. Okay, because I talked about creating a thousand pounds with a rate of 10 percent, 500 pounds with a rate of 20 percent. So that's sort of tool number two. And tool number three, which is the one that's used most often, is the open market operation, which is a grand sounding title for what boils down essentially to buying and selling bonds. Okay, uh, I'll just wrap up by explaining how that works. Now I'm not going to drift into Operation Twist or Quantitative Easing because I've got other videos on those precise topics. But in essence, the other way you can influence the money supply as a central bank is by buying and selling um, government IOUs, if you like. Here's the principle. Okay, If you sell a lot of government IOUs, people will want to buy them because they're safe, they're a nice place to put your money, especially if they're issued by the American or the UK government, for example. So the idea is you sell IOUs, um, commercial organizations and banks bid for them and buy them. That sucks money out of the banking system into the central bank, okay? Reducing the supply of money in the economy because that money is being used to pay for these IOUs, all right? And if there's less money in the economy, then the price of it will change, okay? So the theory is that interest rates will rise slightly. So by basically selling IOUs, okay, that's a government IOUs, the idea is that you, um, T-bills and so on, you suck money out of the banking system because people have got to pay for them somehow. They want to pay for them as a kind of safe haven and so on. And that's going to reduce the money flowing around the banking system and therefore increase the price of money. So that'll have an impact. All right? uh, alternatively, if the government via its central bank decides to start buying back these IOUs, paying them off, if you like, that's going to release central bank funds via the people who buy them into the economy. That means there's more money flowing around the economy in theory, and that will tend more money to push the price down. Okay, So that will tend to reduce the price of money or reduce interest rates. Right? So, um, basically those are the three main mechanisms by which a central bank will attempt to influence um, the supply and potentially the price of money as well. And as I say, the one that tends to be used most commonly of these three weapons um, is that one.